I've received a lot of questions recently about tax shelters and whether or not it's better to enroll in a Roth IRA or 401k versus a traditional IRA or 401k. I think the subject is an important one for anyone who chooses to hold financial assets, and it's worth a video or short series of videos. After all, when it comes to financial assets, taxes are a real killer. And if you're going to play this game, you really have to know the rules. In this video, I'm going to cover the basics of the U.S. individual tax structure. I'll have to be bare bones because the subject could take hours worth of videos to do justice to the topic. I'll simplify things quite a bit and give some concepts that will help people to get started researching the topic on their own. For my subscribers outside of the U.S., I'll have to apologize. I won't be able to cover all of the other countries' individual tax structures, so if you're outside of the U.S., you'll have to research the subject yourselves. Just the same, you may find this video helps you because I think many nations use this type of progressive tax structure and have some similar pitfalls with retirement accounts. The first thing everyone in the U.S. needs to understand is the concept of the tax bracket and the standard deduction. After the recent Tax Reform Act, the deduction for state and local taxes went away, so the vast majority of people are going to just take the standard deduction rather than itemizing. That's good for the sake of this video because it makes the math fairly generalizable and it will cover a lot of people. Now, to figure out your tax bracket, you start with your marital status. Are you married or are you single? If you were single, then your standard deduction is $12,400 in 2020. If you're married, then your standard deduction is $24,800. Now, there are some small adjustments if you are over 65, but we will ignore those for now and just keep the math simple. To figure out your income tax bracket, you take your total income and subtract your standard deduction to calculate your taxable income. For example, if a married couple has a total income of $110,000, then the taxable income will be $110,000 minus $24,800, or $85,200. Referring to the table on the bottom, we can see that in the right-hand column for married people, a taxable income of $85,200 results in a tax bracket of 22%. What does this mean? Does this mean that all of the income is taxed at 22%? No, not at all. It means that the last dollars earned are taxed at 22%. The first $24,800 the couple earned was not taxed at all because it's below the standard deduction. The next $19,750 is taxed at 10%. Above that, the incremental dollars earned are taxed at 12%, and so on, and so on. It's a little convoluted, which is why I made a chart that I will share with you in a moment. But it is critically important for you to understand these principles. So now, back to that 22% tax bracket. Notice it's quite a bit higher than the previous bracket of 12%. So about $5,000 of what our example married couple earned is taxed at 22% at the federal level, whereas everything less than that is taxed at a much lower rate. So what can the couple do to avoid paying this high tax penalty? And this is where the traditional IRA or 401k comes in. It allows the couple to contribute money into an account to be invested in financial assets, and the growth is exempt from taxes until the time of withdrawal. The trick is that the contribution reduces taxable income. So if this hypothetical couple contributes $5,000 to an IRA or 401k, they can reduce this year's tax bill by $1,100. And this is a significant savings. So what's the catch? The catch is that the withdrawals occur uh, when they occur. They are fully taxed as if they are ordinary income. Now, many people cite this as a reason why a Roth IRA or Roth 401k is better. And for those who don't know, a Roth IRA is funded with after-tax money, but the withdrawals later are tax-free. But I tend to disagree that the Roth is usually the better option. For most people, and under most realistic assumptions, the tax paid on the traditional IRA or 401k withdrawal is going to be less than the contribution that went into the account. Let me show you why this is so. I'm going to stick with our married couple and ask the question, how big can their traditional IRA or 401k be before they are worse off tax-wise for having used it? Let's assume both people in our couple are the same age and they want to stop working at age 60. 
They decide that they are going to delay taking Social Security until age 70 and plan to take equal yearly withdrawals from their IRA or 401k for 10 years with the goal of completely depleting their pre-tax tax shelter prior to taking Social Security. There are good reasons to do this, but that's for another video if people are interested in it. Further, suppose they expect that their investments will return an inflation-adjusted 5% per year. Now this is just an example, so let's just use these numbers and see how big the balances can be before their withdrawals exceed 12%, or exceed a tax rate of 12%, which is the tax bracket below where they are now. We know that each year the couple can withdraw $24,800 completely tax-free. This is because their standard deduction is $24,800. How much would need to be in the account to sustain a 10-year withdrawal of $24,800 if the investments grew at 5% per year? The answer is $201,074. Now, the couple can withdraw an additional $19,750 per year and only pay 10% tax on that part. Their starting balance would need to be $160,129 higher to support these withdrawals. Now, on top of that, they can withdraw another $60,500 per year and pay 12% tax on that amount. The present value of this cash stream is $490,523. The main message here is that our couple can take yearly withdrawals of around $105,000 from the account that starts out with a balance of about $850,000 for a full 10 years and pay less tax on it than the tax that they saved by contributing to the account. So as long as they don't accumulate more than $850,000 in a traditional account, the traditional account is the winner compared to the Roth account. And this is even more so if they decide to make their withdrawals go past age 70. Now, remember, our couple was seeking to reduce their income by $5,000 per year to save the 22% tax that would have been paid on it. Is it possible that this $5,000 per year contribution will grow to $850,000 over the course of their working career? It's highly unlikely. And so, there is very little chance of them having to pay more taxes on the tail end than they saved. But even if they did manage to, to accumulate $850,000 in this account, how much tax will they pay on their $105,000 of yearly withdrawals? The first $24,800 is tax-free. The next $19,750 is taxed at 10%. And the last $60,500 is taxed at 12%. So the total tax will be $9,235 per year. Compared to $105,000, this is only a 9% tax rate. So if our couple contributes $5,000 per year and their balance doesn't exceed $850,000, they will be paying less than 9% effective tax on the withdrawals. Is 9% better than 22? I'm no math genius, but I'm pretty sure the answer is yes. If our couple opted for the Roth option instead, then they'd be sacrificing 22% early on to save at most 9% during their retirements. Probably not a good idea. Is it always better for a person to contribute to a traditional IRA or 401k instead of a Roth? What about people who are currently in a low tax bracket? Now, I'm going to be so bold as to say that a person would be better off putting at least some money into the traditional account, at least enough to be able to take it out tax-free thanks to the standard deduction. Paying zero taxes is always better than paying some tax. Of course, the math is different for different assumptions, and so I encourage all of you who make contributions to a tax shelter to do, so, to do some of your own calculations. One thing I did want to address, though, is that there is a real danger in contributing too much to a tr traditional IRA or a 401k. Let's look at a scenario that might happen. Let's suppose our married couple were super savers. They managed to accumulate a lot of money in their traditional tax shelters. I'm going to make it really easy to see what might happen if you save up too much in a traditional IRA or 401k. I took the tax bracket information shown on the previous slide and generated a graph to show how much a person or couple taking the standard deduction will pay in taxes based upon total income. Note that this is total income, not adjusted gross income, which has the standard deduction removed. 
So if a person is single, he or she can look up uh, his or her total income on the x-axis, trace it up to the blue curve, and that will provide the amount of federal tax that will be due in a year. Similarly, a married couple can do this with the red trace. Now, traditional IRAs and 401ks have a really nasty feature called the required minimum distribution. When a 401k or IRA owner is age 72 or older, money has to be removed from the account and tax is paid on it just as if it were ordinary income. The formula for how much needs to be taken out is based upon life expectancy. For a person who is 72 years old, the IRS states that the distribution period is 25.6 years. So a person has to take out about 1 25th of the balance of the account in the year, um, and that's about 4%. What happens when the person doesn't take the RMD? The IRS charges a penalty that is 50% of what the person was supposed to have withdrawn. And this is a huge penalty, so a person better take that distribution. But wait, there's more. As the account owner gets older, the remaining distribution period decreases, and thus the mandated percentage withdrawal increases. Imagine both people in our married couple, in this example, are age, 65, or age 85 years old. According to the IRS, the distribution period for an 85-year-old traditional account holder is 14.8 years. So the percentage withdrawal is now 6.8%. If the account isn't significantly smaller than when the couple was 72 years old, they are going to have to take a much greater distribution and thus pay a higher tax rate. But wait, there's more. What happens if one of the members of our married couple passes away? Let's suppose each person receives $20,000 per year in Social Security and assume that the required minimum distribution increases their total income to $80,000. We'll make the math easy for the sake of this video and just ignore that a portion of the Social Security is not taxable. Before one of them died, they were able to file as a married couple. The $80,000 worth of realized income would have generated federal tax liabilities of $6,229, or 7.8% of the total. That would have left them with $73,771 of money to spend in that year. But now that one of them is dead, the survivor loses the $20,000 that the other was getting in Social Security, and now has to pay taxes as a single filer. The yearly income is now $60,000. The tax due is $5,514, or 9.2% of the total. This leaves the survivor with $54,486 to live on. So the income goes down, but the tax rate goes up, and this is known as the widow's tax trap. Is it unfortunate? Yes. Would the survivor have been better off having put the money in a Roth account instead of the traditional? Probably not. I'm sure there are circumstances where the Roth would turn out to be better, but I doubt that they will apply to the average person. But again, do your own math, use your own assumptions.